My name is David B. Goldstein, and I'm the author of Lost Originals. The book is conceived as a uh, as a kind of experiment in translation. Uh, each section of the book thinks of itself as translating from one kind of experience to another kind of experience, but at no point is it from one language to another language. So uh, uh, at one point, the, uh, the translation is from the voices of inanimate objects into voice. So imagining what uh, dolls, for example, especially dolls without bodies or with only parts of bodies, what they say in the middle of the night and how they whisper. Um, so there's the translation of, of silence and, and the speechless into voice. And there are also all sorts of translations from one kind of language, one kind of English to another kind of English, the kind of the noise of the internet, how that gets translated into another poetic form, how technical language gets translated into poetry. Uh, there's also how art gets translated into poetry. And, uh, as I sort of thought through each of these ways of digesting or um, transforming translation, I started to realize that really translation is another form of metaphor, right? We're always carrying meaning across from, you know, across the, uh, uh, the dark river from one, one source of meaning to another or from the source of meaning to its target. And that's what metaphor means, of course, in, in Greek. It's the, it's the carrying across. Uh, and translation is the Latin, is essentially a Latin translation from the Greek word metaphor, right? It's still the carrying across, the translatio. And what does it mean to think about the two of them together? How, how, is, how does language, how is language, uh, created by translation on the one hand and metaphor on the other. Uh, so the book is really an explanation, or the book is really an exploration of how translation and metaphor are mirrors for each other, how translation can act as a kind of metaphoric space for experience, and how metaphor is just one of a number of kinds of translation from one, one place to another, one form of speaking to another form of speaking. So the book starts with a, a meditation on a series of dolls and images, maps, um, or sort of prospects is what they were called. Uh, uh, and these all came from a kind of strange um, experience that I had several years ago where a group of friends and I decided to form a DIY artist colony and we rented a, a house in Portugal because houses were cheap in Portugal um, and told all, told all our artist friends to come and they were all like yeah totally we're gonna totally do this and then one by one they were all like oh right I don't have any money or ah, I actually have stuff that I have to do I can't just drop everything and go to Portugal for a month. So uh, it ended up to be just me and my partner, Mindy Strick, and uh, who's an artist, uh, and friends of ours who weren't artists, and a couple of people who were uh, sort of working on art, but mostly vacationing. And uh, we got to this house, and we had rented it from, the house was owned by an antiques dealer. Uh, and he had said he was going to put away all the breakables. So we are like, okay, fine, we'll have plenty of, space to wander around. We get there, it's a, I think, 10 room house. It was actually two houses connected by a, a rear courtyard. It's a medieval house, this weird, like, you know, none of the rooms are shaped normally. And it's packed full of little antique objects of various kinds. And by full, I mean, not a single uh, empty space on which to put a cup of coffee, except for the dining room table. I mean, everything is covered, right? And uh, it turned out what he meant by the breakables was the really expensive crystal, which he had put in a um, in a, yet another room at the back of the house. But everything else was, of course, totally breakable. It was all this glassware and porcelain and just, you know, all this crazy stuff. And for the first week, we were sort of 
I mean, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous house, but it was full of voices. It was full of these, uh, you know, disembodied um, energies. I, sorry, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy to say that, but but it's a, it was a house that was very full of things that were not us. And we were clearly, you know, we were making space in a house where we were clearly guests and the objects ruled the house. So I was trying to work on another project, and after a week of it, I gave up, and I was wandering around the, uh, wandering the house at midnight, and thinking, "What am I going to do?" And I stopped in front of one of these objects, was which was a doll, a uh, very strange uh, doll, which is native to the Iberian Peninsula, called uh, a Santo doll, a saint doll, which uh, usually are dolls that have extremely expressive faces, very carefully painted faces that are full of either suffering or joy or both. Uh, and then usually very big arms and hands and no body. They have a wooden cage where their, where their body or, or legs should go. Um, and maybe they have a little skirt or maybe not. And I sat down in front of one of these dolls and felt like the doll was speaking to me and thought, okay, either I'm hallucinating or going insane, which is always a possibility, or, you know, something in my brain has connected with, with this object. Whatever it is, this is where poetry starts, where some, something from the outside enters you, right? And you just have to kind of figure it out. For um, when Jack Spicer talks about it, one of my favorite poets, he talks about maybe it's tuning into Martians on the radio, you know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's some ghostly voice, but it's always from the outside coming into you. And that, that to me is what, what it means to produce art is to be inhabited by something that's not fully you. Um, so I just started writing you know, translations of what the dolls were saying. And that led to the porcelain objects that were also there, bronze objects. There's a lion's head door knocker in the, in the book. And, uh, and then also to the images of these, um, these prospects that were made in the 18th century by, uh, by a guy named Millar, spelled with an A. No relation, I assume, but there it is. Um, uh, and these, uh, Prospects were published as a book, but they were separated into different um, uh, different images that were framed throughout the house. So I started writing about those prospects as well. And the whole thing sort of came together in this weird uh, embodied, disembodied series of voices that weren't mine, but that I recognized as my language. I think that whenever I write, there's always a tension for me between that sort of romantic idea of expression, what's, what's the thing that you yourself want to express, and a more, um, uh, more postmodern idea of things inhabiting you or entering you, and, and uh, that, that the words that you say are, are the words of others. We didn't make language, we might shape it, but there's all this stuff going on around us and that we we as artists kind of cathect that or, or bring that through our bodies and our brains. And so for me, writing is always a negotiation between those two things. And I think that Laws of Rest, the first book, was, it had tons of found language in it, but, um, but it was also very consistent. I had found a form and a... Um, and a style that seemed to really work for that particular form. And I was just kind of following it through. I started writing like that and then felt like it was a series that needed to be completed. Um, this book was very different, and I think it sounds very different from the first one. Uh, it has very little prose poetry in it, for example, which is what the first one is entirely. Uh, but I think that that's because this book, I really felt like, was led by whatever the objects or phenomena were that I encountered while I was sort of uh, in a space of receptivity. So that the, for me, this book is very much just about listening. It's about listening to what was going on around me, to 
things that other artists and writers were doing, but also things that an inanimate objects were doing, things that uh, uh, things that art was doing to me, or that different things that just crossed my path were somehow leaking into me. Um, so I think that accounts for a lot of the formal experiment in the book, and by experiment I mean very different from what the first book looked like, that the form was really dictated by whatever was speaking or whatever I was able to hear, rather than a sense of, okay, this has to, this has to be consistent. I, I, need a, I need a unified kind of space in which to operate. I think that the book starts out on sort of firm lyric ground or relatively firm lyric ground because all of the voices of these dolls are very unified. The dolls themselves are clear about their own identities, much clearer about their identities than I am about mine. And uh, as, the, as the book moves, I think it gets progressively more interested in fragmentation and, and disjunction. Uh, so that by the end of the book, the last uh, section of the book, which is also uh, inspired by a different set of voices, it's inspired by uh, uh, the sound artistry of um, Akira Rabelais, who's a Los Angeles-based artist whose work is totally fascinating to me. Um, and so those poems, which I wrote in response to his uh, very themselves very sort of uh, disjointed and strange pieces, uh, came out as uh, a real exploration in how much you can pull apart the fabric of language in order to allow sound to stream into those spaces, right? So it's very much about the, the ways in which language incorporates and allows sound through it. Uh, and then I further complicated that by taking the first eight poems that I wrote based on uh, the pieces that I had been listening to of Rabelais's work and retranslating them through a bunch of translation websites. Now, you know, a few years ago when I was doing this, translation websites and uh, technology were much shoddier than, than Google Translate is now. And I, I sort of long for that earlier time because Alta Vista and Babelfish, which is what I was using, got things so wrong that they made instant poetry. I mean, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. It was so easy. You put something in, you run it through five different languages, and it comes out a complete mystery with a mixture of words that are recognizable, words that are made up, words that are halfway between one language and another, sentence structures that are sort of coming apart in this uh, strange sort of web-like way. So I used that as a, as a kind of creative technique for, for breaking the, the work apart further and seeing what the gaps were and seeing where the openings were. And then I kind of put it back together in a way that I hope sounds like an echo so that each poem is a strange translated echo of the one that came before it, kind of runs parallel to it. You can see in some ways how, th how one thing became another thing, but they're two separate worlds and they speak in different ways. I think of the book as a, uh, as a sort of grand series of collaborations. Collaborations between me and things that are inanimate or that I have no connection with, except through the book and through the work, but also collaborations with people that I respect. Um, uh, and the, the sort of core of that is a group of us when I, the last place I lived was Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, four of us there uh, decided to get together and form a, a little artist collective. And we wrote a bunch of stuff. It was two poets, a photographer, and a sound artist. And the four of us did a, a several different kinds of experiments, really designed to sort of make sense of the place we were living in. We were all uh, from elsewhere. Um, from the East Coast, from the West Coast, one from Texas, and Oklahoma was a kind of foreign land to all of us. And so we explored it the only way that we could figure out how to explore it, which was through art. Um, so we would just wander around the city, taking pictures, writing, 
uh, recording sounds, and then we'd bring them back together in the studio and play around with them and see what we could do. And that process really uh, is, I think, what stands behind a lot of the a lot of the book, even if it wasn't directly collaborative with those people. Some of it is. The series Nurse Shark in the book, for example, came out of a series of poems that one of those uh, one of the members of the collective, Nathan Halverson, and I traded back and forth. So we were using the same kinds of techniques that I uh, used in the Akira Rabelais section, the Mariana Trench, where we would take uh, uh, writing from online. For some reason, it was all about sharks. It was journalism about sharks, scientific papers, things like that. And we would pull language out of it and construct a poem and then send it uh, to the other person who would then translate it through all those uh, websites or just make something new out of it and send it back and we'd just go back and forth. So that section, which includes, I think, two of Nathan's poems, we sort of lost track after a while as to whose poem was whose, but, uh, uh, but I credit him with, uh, um, with much of the inspiration and some of the actual language in there. Um, uh, so that's, that's how that section got uh, formed. Um, the other person, the sort of major collaborator in the book, is uh, my partner, Mindy Strick, the photographer in that collective, who I'm very lucky to be able to call upon to collaborate with pretty much whenever. And uh, she did the cover image of the book at the same time that I was working on the doll poems. She was experimenting with cyanotypes and all these keys that that this antiques dealer had that didn't open anything in the house. 20, 30 keys, dozens of keys that were keys to nothing, which uh, we found fascinating, of course. Um, but she also uh, did a series of uh, self-portraits that I was very interested in. That, In fact, I think she did before we even met, but I wanted to write a series of poems based on those portraits, which I did, and then we exhibited them together uh, in a series called You Be the Arpeggio, which is now also in the book. But we, for the book, we took the images away. We felt like the, the, uh, the poems would stand as, a, again, a kind of echo of the image. You can sort of see and hear the image through it, um, but it's not, you know, the original is lost, except for one, which is at the which is a beautiful color image at the beginning of the series, which I love. So, uh, so yeah, the entire... The entire book is really built around a collaborative ethos. It doesn't, it, it, it follows my idea that none of my poetry just comes from me. It all comes from communication, opening, transference, collaboration, a movement across and among different minds, different objects, different people. And that to me is, is the way that art emerges in the world. This is a poem called Gathering Marigolds, uh, and it came out, once again, a collaborative poem. It came out of uh, a class that I taught, a creative writing class that, that I teach at York, uh, where a couple of my students, I think the assignment was to write a Google or Flarf poem or something, and a couple of my students wrote a flower poem. And I got so interested in it that I just decided, OK, I can do one of those, and, and took the word marigolds and uh, ran it through Google a bunch of times and created this list of uh, references to marigolds and then uh, wrote the poem based off of it. And then I read it to my students when we always, at the end of the year, we, all, we always do a little uh, literary cafe. And so I read the poem to my students, and they really liked it. And they ended up writing a chapbook, um, uh, sort of uh, a very incredibly sweet, amazing chapbook that they dedicated to me that was called Mara Goldstein, um, which I just adore. So, so this poem is for all my students, and especially that group. Gathering Marigolds. I remember marigolds. I remember marigolds, zinnias, and asters. I remember marigolds there, zinnias, pansies early, hollyhocks. I remember marigolds staining my white socks. I remember marigolds, impatience, 
an ageratum. Here is what I remember. Marigolds have an odor, so be prepared for that. I remember marigolds everywhere when we were in Xenia. I remember marigolds sprouted in a Dixie cup brought home from brownies. They were my mother's favorite plants once Victoria Day had passed. I remember marigolds and the Taj Mahal, room 302. I remember marigolds, they stank, and I think daylilies and irises. Are you new? Ari asked suddenly. Because I haven't seen you before. I remember marigolds. Yeah, I remember marigolds. This is not what I remember marigolds looking like. Some summers now, a lone poppy rises in the field. For some reason, I remember marigolds. The stars at night, sleeping with the Indian moon, a white sheet on the window. As a child, I remember marigolds being my absolute favorites. I remember marigolds placed in the spokes of an old rusted wheel. The acrid smell of salix leaves. Some streets and the bazaar, the train to Srinagar. Their front yard was the only place I remember marigolds. I remember marigolds. That was my job. Mostly I remember marigolds and onion skins. I remember marigolds, zinnias, bachelor buttons, and snapdragons. Oh, and the peonies. Porcelain cicadas. <clears throat> Porcelain cicadas. Once we were people, then we were people in the rain. Dying swept through us like a god, and we realized that all along we had been both gods and dead. Maintain your line, we said, and yours. Where were they? Now our only task is to listen for you underneath the hum. We are almost free. We are almost grass. What sounds do you make here in the dining room of yourselves? Sound is your line of guarantee. What pains us most is the sound of your absent wings. We understand it is painful to have feathers bristle out all over your mind, making your thoughts bleed with longing you cannot pronounce. We understand that fields, too, are painful, and mountains. We see you as a series of tiles falling into space. At times, <clears throat> I'm going to do that line again. We see you as a series of tiles falling into space, at times with a clink, as at the bottom of a well, sometimes with no aftersound, as a nun speaks in a cork convent, as a lover speaks to an insensible beloved. You are lamps tied to cables, constantly adjusting yourselves, throwing light first on one corner of the dark room, then another, a whirring of wings if you are lucky against the rafters. Cobblestones, too, are blind until glistening with rain. Just as you begin to notice us, our wings will unfold from our hard bodies and we will leave these walls. We will rejoin language consciousness, which you call color, and will report everything we have heard. Here is what we heard. Longing, the pretense of longing, and arguing over finances. Here is how it looks to us. The long egg strings of your sentences drop one by one into the wells and disappear, language taking the form of the mist.